Uh, uh, well, good to see all of you here this morning. Uh, a couple of really quick announcements. Number one is if you were here a couple weeks ago, uh, Mark, our new cruise director, uh, shared with you our Share a Meal Sunday, which is just going to happen in a couple of weeks. Uh, if you didn't have an opportunity to sign up, we're looking for people to host other uh, Hill, Hillside members to their home for a meal, or you can sign up to go to someone's house for a meal. And I'll be honest with you, we're looking for more people to actually go to have a meal than host a meal. So um, we may have to double up there or something. So uh, there are uh, forms out there on the table. We just need some basic information so that we can get people uh, partnered up really well there. The deadline to get those back is next Sunday uh, because then we want to get it matched up and then have a meal together. So if you're interested in that, those uh, that information is out there. Uh, Cruise Director Mark, he'll be out there. He'll be waiting for you after the service as well. And of course, anyone who wants to play softball, uh, sign up sheet is out there as well. Looks like we're ha gonna have a pretty good uh, number of players on the team. But uh, if you would like to play, because through the summer people can make it, other people can't. So it'd be good to have uh, more than enough people that sign up out there uh, is is out there as well. And then uh, anything that is that I just didn't mention is in the bulletin there. Hopefully you can read that and see some of those other things that are happening. But today we are beginning a new series entitled Sequel. We're going to look at the first few uh, chapters from the book of Acts and see how the life of the early church was lived out. How many of you have ever finished a book or a movie and it, it, at the end of it, you said, boy, I really hope there's a sequel. Anyone like that? Okay, yeah. You come to the end and you're like, hey, I wonder what happened to these characters and, and you're really hoping that they do a sequel to the movie, a sequel to the book. How many of you have watched a sequel or read a sequel and said they shouldn't have made a sequel? <laughs> yeah, there's a, been a lot like that as well. And, and one of the instances that happened, you may not know this, but in 1956, there was a book written by Dodie Smith, and the title of the book was The 101 Dalmatians. I'm sure you've heard of that, that story because in 1961, uh, Walt Disney Productions actually made this book into a movie. And spoiler alert if you haven't seen the movie, okay? I'm just warning you right now. Uh, the story is about how two Dalmatians uh, are working to find their puppies who had been taken to a fur factory by the evil Cruella de Vil, and, and they go through all these obstacles to find their puppies. Long story short, they end up finding their puppies plus 90 plus other puppies. And they, the story ends with the two Dalmatians and the 99 puppies living with their family. And so this story became so popular that Dodie Smith decided to write a sequel to the 101 Dalmatians. Did you know there was a sequel to it? In 1967, she wrote a book called The Barking, uh, The Starlight Barking. And just as the 101 Dalmatians is delightful, the Starlight Barking is terrible. Okay. It, the reason why you never heard of it is because it is a terrible sequel. And so the, the sequel to 101 Dalmatians starts out with the 101 Dalmatians or with their owners. And one day they wake up and they discover that all the humans on the planet have been put to sleep by an alien. Okay. Hold on, it gets better. And so the, the Dalmatians then receive the ability to communicate with one another via telepathy. And not only that, but they have the ability to control all the things in their environment through telekinesis. Like they can make elevators operate just by thinking about it. And not only that, but the, the Dalmatians can now fly around the world. It's no wonder that when Disney Productions did a sequel to the 101 Dalmatians, they did not consult Dodie Smith's work because it's just bad. And Dodie Smith, I think, forgot a very key element when writing a sequel. You need, anytime there's a sequel, you need to look back to stay on track. You need to look back to stay on track. And so we're doing a series here in uh, the first few chapters of Acts in which we're going to look back so that we can stay on track. Uh, the early church that's what they did. The, the early church was a sequel to the, the message, the ministry, and the mission of Jesus. And Jesus started the, the message. He started the ministry. He started the, the mission. And Jesus, of course, died and 
He rose again, and we celebrated that last week, and he ascended into heaven, and he gave his followers the, the command to continue on, to be the sequel to what he had started. And so the early church was the sequel to that, and even you and I today, as we sit here today, we are a sequel to the sequel. The sequel is just continuing as the church continues to move across the globe. And so we are, over the next few weeks, as a church, we're going to look back so that you and I, and as a church, we can stay on track. Because if we look back to how the early church operated, I think it will be very important for us to, to see how effective they were and the way in which God used them so that we too can experience that same thing as we continue to write the sequel to the ministry, the message, and the mission of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this series uh, is, uh, our memory verse for this series is found in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And it tells us there, Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. He said, hey, one day you guys are going to scatter all over the entire world world. And that is the sequel that Jesus had given to them to continue to write, to continue to live out as they, as we, as his followers, as his people, to continue to expand his message, his ministry, and his mission. And so today, we're over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some firsts in the church. We're going to look at the first instructions that were given to the church. We're going to look at the, the first gathering of the church. We're going to look at the first preaching of the gospel by the church. The first missionary endeavors as they crossed boundaries as the church. And when I use that word church, the word church that we find in the scriptures is not what you and I think of today. Oftentimes when we think of the word church, we think of a building. We think of an address. We think of a certain time in during the week. We think of the leaders of the organization. We think of church as an organization, but that is not what Jesus intended the church to be. That's not how he intended the sequel to be lived out. The word that Jesus said when in Matthew chapter 16, when he told his disciples, I will build my church, the word that Jesus used there is a Greek word, ekklesia. And it's literally translated, I will build my gathering, my assembly, my congregation. He didn't have an organization in mind. He didn't have a building in mind. He didn't have a certain time during the week in mind. He had you and I in mind. Look around you. We are the church, every single one of us. And that word ekklesia is actually a compound word in the Greek language. And literally, if you took the two words that make up this compound word, it means called out. That the church, this gathering, this assembly that Jesus was going to put together was to be a multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multicultural gathering of his people. And so as we go through here, I'm just going to put my cards out on the table. As we go through this series, I've decided I'm not even going to use the word church. I'm going to use Jesus' assembly, his gathering, his congregation, because I want us to have the right understanding of what Jesus intended when he talked about his church, and his people. And so today we're going to start by looking at the first instructions Jesus gave to his gathering. And we're going to be here in Acts chapter 1. And in Acts chapter 1, we know that Acts was written by Luke. Luke was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. You can read about that all throughout the book of Acts. And Luke is very upfront, and he said, hey, what I'm writing here is actually a sequel to something else I had just written. You see, the first volume is what we call the Gospel of Luke, and the sequel now is Acts. So if you look in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, here Luke said, he said, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all the things that Jesus began to do and teach. He said, hey, the first volume, I wrote about the things that Jesus began to do. Which leads us to understand that here in Acts, it's the second volume, it's the sequel. And he said, they're gonna, we're going to see how Jesus continued to do, what Jesus continued to do, what Jesus continued to teach through his people, through his gathering, through his assembly of people. And so that's why I've called this series Sequel, because we're going to look at how God moved and how Jesus moved through his people to continue on his message his ministry, 
and his mission. And so today we're looking at the movement, the movement of the church. And what I want you to see today is that the church is a movement, not a monument. The gathering of God's people is to be a movement, not a monument. We are to be a movement that propagates his, his, his mission, not a monument that just simply commemorates his mission. We are to be active. We are to move forward. And what we're going to see here is how Jesus intended for his gathering, for his assembly, to move forward. And so we're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 1, beginning in the third verse. And the first thing that we see here is the pillar of the, mo- of, of the movement. That it's important for us to understand that last week we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus on Resurrection Sunday. And that is what the early church looked back to. That's why, as, as, as Jesus followers, we gather together on the first day of the week because that commemorates every single week. We're commemorating the resurrection, which took place on the first day of the week. And so that's why we gather together on Sundays. If there had been no resurrection, there would be no gathering like this because the movement of Jesus... The gathering of Jesus' followers is dependent upon the foundation, the pillar of his resurrection. And Luke made that very clear as he began writing here in the book of Acts. And so we pick it up in verse 3. He said, to these he also presented himself alive after his sufferings. So we, we pick it up here and the disciples are together. Jesus has risen from the dead. And here Luke said that he presented himself alive to his followers, that that they actually saw him. This wasn't an aberration. It wasn't a hallucination that they actually saw him. And John, one of the disciples who would have been there that day, he wrote later on in 1 John chapter 1, he said, the things that we have seen, the things that we have touched, the things that we have listened to concerning the word of life, what John is saying is, hey, I saw him. I, 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 I held on to him. I heard him speaking because he presented himself to them at this time. He presented himself alive after his suffering. Luke went on by many convincing proofs. Now, Luke used a very, very specific term there when he was talking about these convincing proofs. That word in the Greek is only found once in the entire New Testament, and it's right here. However, in Luke's day, it was found throughout Greek literature. Most specifically, it was found in medical writings, which is appropriate because Luke was a physician. And so he would have read these things. And the word is used outside of the New Testament in a medical situation, uh, not to really talk about signs and symptoms, but indisputable evidence. Okay, And so basically, it goes like this. You know, if you woke up this morning and you said, oh, I got chest pains, that could be a sign or symptom of a heart attack. Could also be a sign and symptom that you had bad Taco Bell last night, okay? So you go to the hospital and they hook you up to an EKG, and the EKG would be proof that you're actually having a heart attack. That's the difference here. And so here, Luke used that term. He used that term from the medical uh, field of his day, and he brought it over, and he said what Jesus did here by appearing is that he, he presented himself alive by indisputable evidence, right? The empty tomb that we celebrated last week is a sign that Jesus rose from the dead because somebody went in and stole his body. And so Jesus comes back and he shows himself, he presents himself to his disciples as indisputable proof that he had raised from the dead. And so that's why Luke used this very specific term. He said, to those he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs. And he went on and he said, appearing, or, and appearing to them over a period of 40 days. Now, again, this indicates to us that this happened repeatedly for 40 days, for a month, for a little over a month that he showed up and he appeared to them day after day after day. They didn't have repeated hallucinations. They they were not having 
uh, these visions of something, but this was actually something that had happened and he appeared to them over the course of 40 days. And not only that, but speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. I imagine, I have no idea, but I imagine that over the course of that 40 days, Jesus taught them about what this new gathering of his people was going to look like. I can only assume he expounded on his words from Matthew chapter 16 when he told Peter, he said, I will build my ecclesia, my gathering, my assembly. I will build that. And I imagine over these 40 days after the resurrection and before his ascension into heaven, he's teaching them. He's saying, hey, guys, listen, you need to understand this is going to be bigger than you could ever imagine. This is to do as my followers. It had to have been an amazing and exciting 40 days as these, these early disciples were seeing Jesus day after day after day. And what Jesus, I think, taught them over those 40 days was this. My gathering, my assembly, my church is not just to be a monument to me. It's to be a movement for me. And we go on here and we see the second point that Jesus made, and that is the promise of the movement. That here, Jesus makes a promise to them, and he uses, he tells them something that when you read it at first glance, if you really understand what's happening here, you say, did he really say that? Because he, he doesn't tell them to go, he tells them to wait. I want you to wait. Look at what it says here. Jerusalem but to wait. Like, if you had had no context for Christianity whatsoever, no context for what had happened in the past, or how God had dealt with his people, or the promises that God had made, you'd read that and you would stop and you'd say, what? Like, Jesus, you just rose from the dead? You would expect Jesus to say, okay, I'm alive. I've showed you over the last 40 days. What I want you to do right now is to go tell everyone. That's not what he said. He said, I... Come back. I've met with you for 40 days. What I want you to do now is wait. Because there was a promise that had not yet been fulfilled in their lives. And so Jesus goes on and he tells them exactly why he wanted them to wait. He said, gathering together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he had said, you heard of from me. This promise that, that, that God had made to his people, the promise that Jesus had reiterated to his followers, goes on in verse 5, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Back in Ezekiel chapter 36, 600 years before the events of this day, God had promised his people. He said, my spirit, through the prophet Ezekiel, he said, my spirit will live in you, and you will walk in my statutes, and you will be able to observe my ordinances. 600 years earlier, three to four years before this happened, John the Baptist out there in his camel hair eating locusts and honey, he's baptizing people, and he tells them, hey, I'm baptizing you with water for repentance of sins. But there's one who's coming after me who is mightier than me, and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus reminded them of this promise. And in in John chapter 16, Jesus said, it's good for you if I go away. They're like, wow, what are you talking about? He says, because if I don't go away, then the helper can't come. But if I go away, I will send him to you. And here Jesus again reminds them of this promise that had been made by God 600 years earlier, had been reiterated through John the Baptist and what Jesus had reminded them. And listen, for them, this would have been a huge paradigm shift. Because in the Old Testament, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit theology went like this, that the Holy Spirit would come upon a specific person for a specific time to complete a specific task. So the Holy Spirit would come upon the king so that he could be the king of God's people. The Holy Spirit would come upon prophets so they could prophesy for God. We can read about it how that when they were building the tabernacle, the Holy Spirit came upon the workmen so that they could craft the tabernacle the way God designed it. But now what Jesus is saying to them, he's saying, hey, I'm just blowing your mind here. 
the Holy Spirit's not just going to come upon certain people for certain times, but the Holy Spirit is going to come upon all my people for all time. And that's the promise that you had heard from God. It's the promise that I've reminded you about. That, the, that you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I remember back when my son was, uh, I think, seven or eight, and uh, he wanted to learn how to play chess because my father-in-law loves to play chess. He said, I want to learn how to play chess because I want to beat Poppy. I said, I love the way you're thinking, okay? <laughs> and so I sat him down and, and I taught him how to play chess and how to move the pawns and the rooks and all the pieces on the board. And then finally, we went to visit my in-laws and he said, I want to play Poppy and chess. And he asked me, he said, you sit next to me. And I would sit there and he was playing as his grandfather in chess and I would lean over. a piece and he would look at me to see if that's what he could make and and I would whisper and I would let him know hey you need to watch when Poppy makes this move and then finally he beat his grandfather and he jumped up and he declared loudly to everyone who could hear I beat Poppy and as I think about that that's exactly what Jesus promised concerning the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit would be in us to advise us which piece to move next. The Holy Spirit would be there to confirm that we are following Jesus in the right way. He'd given us the Holy Spirit who would whisper in our ear and tell us the things that we need to watch out for so that you and I as His people in this movement would be victorious. Victorious over sin. Victorious over the enemy victorious over the, all the forces of the world that are trying to hold us back, and ultimately victorious even over death itself. Because of this promise. He said, I've made you this promise because my church, my gathering, my assembly is not a monument. It's a movement. Which leads us to the very next thing that happens here, and that is the power of the, of the movement how Jesus empowered his people and the power that would be necessary for his movement to move forward. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but Isaac Newton's uh, theory of motion, it's F equals MA. I'm just showing you how smart I am, which just simply stands for force equals, equals mass times acceleration, which just simply means this. The bigger an object is, the more force it needs to move forward. And the more force that's put on something, the faster it's going to move forward. And here, Jesus uses Newton's law of, of motion, and he says, hey, I'm going to empower this movement. I want this movement to go to the remotest parts of the earth, and so I am going to empower it to move. And look at what he says as he empowers this movement. Begin here. Uh, verse number six. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord... Is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Which, when we read that, you have to understand, this would have been a logical question for them to, to ask. Because for generation after generation after generation, they were waiting for the coming Messiah who would restore to Israel the glory of its golden years. Those years when David was king and there was prosperity and there was peace and there was growth in the country. And now the disciples are looking and are saying, hey, you're the Messiah. You died. You rose again. You've been here with us for 40 days and you've been teaching us. Is now the time? Is now the time that you're going to restore Israel to its former glory? There's no reason why they would not ask that question. And what I find interesting next is that Jesus doesn't really necessarily correct them. Look at what he says, though. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. He said, I'm, It's not that Jesus said, I'm not going to do that. He's just saying, You don't need to know the time. You don't need to know when that's going to happen. And what he does here is he blows their mind and he says, because right now, guys, you're thinking way too small. You, you got to think bigger than that. And he goes on, he says in verse 8, but you will receive power. Now that power, that, that word that is used in the Greek language, the word that Luke used there is where we get our English word dy dynamic or dynamo. The Greek word is dunamis. And he said, you will 
Now, in, in most Greek literature, the, de- the way that word power is defined is by the context of, of the sentence. And so basically it would be, hey, you will receive power to, to, be, to achieve great military might. And so the power that would be given to you would be a great general. Or, hey, the, you, you're going to receive power to lift something heavy, so the power you're going to receive is, is physical strength. Here, the power is left in def- it, it, it's undefined. And so basically what Jesus said to him, he said, you will receive power to achieve whatever needs to be achieved. You will receive the power that you need to say whatever needs to be said. You will receive the power to obey whatever needs to be obeyed. He kind of just left it undefined. He says, you're going to receive this power. And because of that power, the most unlikely person Becomes a, becomes a fountain of spiritual power. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit, the most unqualified person becomes a stream of competency. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit, the most ill-equipped person becomes a sea of ability. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit, the most inadequate person has an ocean of sufficiency all through the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit, he says, has come upon you. This is the power. So this is the power that's going to propel forward my people, my assembly, my gathering. This is the power that's going to create uh, uh, allow and empower my people not just to be a monument, but to be a movement that's going to last thousands and thousands of years. But then Jesus wrapped this up, and he gave the purpose of the movement. Again, in verse 8, our memory verse for this entire series, he tells them what he's going to give them, and why he's going to give it to them. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. He said, you're going to be my witnesses. What's a witness? A witness is just somebody who tells somebody else what they've seen, what they've heard, what they've experienced. And he's basically telling his disciples, hey, you're worried about the restoration of Israel. I'm worried about the salvation of the world. And don't worry about when the kingdom's going to be restored. What I want you to be focused on is being my witnesses that are going to go to the remotest parts of the earth. That is what Jesus is concerned about. He said, you are going to be people who testify and are witnesses to every tongue, every tribe, every nation on the world. He said, my gathering, my assembly, my people are going to be witnesses. Everywhere you go, you're going to be a witness. You're going to tell people about my death and my burial and my resurrection. You're going to be people who are witnesses, who are going to declare about what you've seen and what you've heard and what you've experienced, the ways in which God has worked in your life and, and the salvation you've been given through Jesus. And that's why it's important for us to understand this. If the focus of God's assembly, if the focus of of Jesus' gathering of people is anything other than the salvation of the world, it's the wrong focus. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Some small backwoods town called Bellwood, Pennsylvania. You will be my witnesses. Because his church is a movement, not a monument. It's a movement that's to propagate 
his ministry, his message, and his mission, not a monument to commemorate his mission, his ministry, and his message. So you have to be asking yourself, right? So because all of that is true, what should we do? And so I want to wrap up today, and I want to encourage you today to participate in the movement. Participate in the movement. Get involved in what Jesus is seeking to do through his people, through his assembly, through his gathering. Because, listen, his movement is bigger than you and I could ever understand. And I don't want to ever be a church, a gathering, an assembly that takes for granted what God is doing in the world around us. And so I want all of us to participate in the movement. So how do we do that? I'm glad you asked, okay? Four very simple steps. You've heard these before. I'm sorry to bore you with these, but these are so important. Number one, I want you to connect. I want you to connect with God here at the local church. I want you to be here. I want you to show up. I want you to write down. I want you to live out, hopefully, practical teaching in your life so that you can go out and engage a lost and dying world with the great message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second step is to grow. I want you to grow in your relationships through small groups, through D groups. Hey, there's this new thing coming up called Share a Meal Sunday. It's a great way to grow in relationships. There is something powerful. We're going to look at this in a few weeks. There's something powerful that happens when we share a meal with someone. There's bonds, there's roots that grow into each other's lives that I don't think happens outside of a setting like that. So, there are forums out in the foyer if you didn't know about that, okay? So uh, just share a meal with someone. Be around other believers. So connect, grow. Thirdly, serve. Serve the way God has gifted you, the way the talents, the abilities, the gifts, the resources that God has given to you. Use those. Uh, Bible school's coming up here in just a couple months. I'm sure they would love to have as many helpers as possible for that. And so there's all kinds of ways to serve in your workplace and serve in your community and serve in your home, but serve. Serve in the name of Jesus Christ. And then finally go. You shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. You have people just like I have people in my life, friends and relatives and co-workers and neighbors who are far, far from Jesus that Jesus wants to bring in and make part of the assembly, to make part of the gathering. People from all walks of life, people from all cultures and all backgrounds that he wants to bring together to make his assembly. So finally, just go. Go. The church is a movement, not a monument. So participate in the movement. And you, listen, you will be glad that you did. Because if you go to Europe today, the church stopped participating. And now, if you go to Europe today, the church literally is a monument no longer of movement. You know, just a, a hundred some years ago, Europe was the, the epicenter of, of the Christian movement, of the church, of the Jesus assembly. You go to Europe today and you walk into a church, there's not people worshiping. It's filled with tourists because the church has literally become a monument and it's no longer of movement because people took it for granted. And they did not participate in the movement. And it's literally become a monument. The church is to be a movement, not a monument. So participate in the movement. And until next week, go serve your king. Father, we thank you today for your word. Thank you for the early church. Thank you for the example that they are to us today. I pray that we would be able to look back so that we can stay on track. God, I pray that you would move in our midst, that you would uh, just empower us and encourage us to participate in what you're doing in the world around us, in our, in our classrooms and in our workplaces and in our, in our homes and in our neighborhoods, that we would see the ways in which you are moving, the ways in which you're asking us to move on your behalf, and that you would use us for the furtherance of the sequel, that the sequel would continue to be written as you're... And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.